Let's review the problem that we started last time and remember the situation that we're dealing with is that we have, we know that some um, drums, containers, metallic containers of uh, hazardous waste of one sort or another has been buried at this site. And uh, of course the magnetic survey is undertaken in order to help us locate uh, metallic materials, ferromagnetic, ferromagnetic material. But we have a complication here because the bedrock is also magnetic. It's a basalt, so we know that it's going to be contributing to the anomalous field that we see if we have any topography in the bedrock here. <clears throat> so the idea is to run a complementary gravity survey, figure out what the geometry of the bedrock is and what its contribution, therefore, would be to the magnetic anomaly that we see up here. And at this point, we're really unsure, you know, is this, could, could this feature over here be associated with some buried uh, metallic debris? This pronounced anomaly, most likely, no question, but uh, uh, other features in the line. So we reason that once we figure out what the bedrock contribution is to the anomaly, the residual would be associated with the buried uh, drums and uh, uh, containers of hazardous material at the at the site. So that's kind of our working uh, <coughs> background and uh, the, the idea associate, associated with the complementary gravity and magnetic um, survey. So once we figured out what the configuration of the bedrock is, and, you know, if we go back in and we do this again, we may come up with something slightly different, but we have pretty good um, pretty good idea of what the bedrock geometry is. We did make an assumption about the valleys extending in and out to an infinity, so we, you know, depending on the site conditions there, we might have to modify that, but the, we're left with um, a significant magnetic anomaly that is clearly unassociated with the magnetic field of the, of the bedrock here, and that's, that would be this feature here, so we're, we're pretty confident that the drums that were buried at the site are located here. Uh, <clears throat> and we, so we're going, going to be concentrating our modeling then in this particular area. However, we, we also realize that, um, you know, in, in this area, um, which goes down close to 40, 40 feet or so, you know, more than 10 meters, that we have this uh, inverse cube law which, which uh, we're dealing with when we're looking at dipole fields. So the drop off of the dipole field is as 1 over the distance cubed. So if we triple the depth, we're going we're gonna to have uh, 1 27th the uh, field. So I think whatever, you know, if you come in here and you do this modeling, which we're going to take a stab at, uh, we're, we should feel a little bit less confident down in this region. As we get deeper and deeper, we may be missing uh, the locations of, of drums. Now, <clears throat> we've got um, this anomaly that we're going to measure. We put an object in here. We also realize that the um, we have to control the, the extent of the drum in and out of the um, in and out of the profile line. We assume that our profile line goes directly over the center of the drum, and I've just you know kind of highlighted it here. So we're just going uh, 2.5 feet in this direction, 2.5 feet in this direction, whereas the um, uh, bedrock, of course, is, is going out to plus and minus infinity. So <clears throat> the bedrock depth has been uh, constrained by the gravity, and uh, these corner coordinates have to be left in place, and um, I think I have enough time here. Let me just, uh, just come back here to the model and note that in our in our model here, we, <coughs> we've given the bedrock a susceptibility of 0 0.006. Now, if we undertake an inversion here 
of the the um, of the bedrock uh, in this region and uh, don't turn off the susceptibility if we undertake an inversion. We could, we could also uh, select these points for, uh, for inversion as uh, well, and I, you know, it will be interesting to, to, to see what happens. But we can go through this uh, process of, um, of, an, of inversion, and I better control this parameter here, let's see, and this parameter here. And then we'll just let the let the model go, and uh, you'll see that the bedrock then begins to to form significantly, uh, trying to match this feature. But we don't want that to happen. So um, so we're our our intent here at this point is to turn off the bedrock uh, susceptibility. So we would come back into our model and zero this out because the bedrock is just where we want it to be at this uh, at this point in time and we don't want our inversion of this object then to uh, also incorporate changes in the configuration of the, the bedrock. That kind of de defeats our purpose so um, so that's um, something that we have to, to make sure that we do. Also, we, when we put the drums in there, we, they have a much, much higher susceptibility than the uh, basaltic bedrock. They're about 0.55 CGS. We have to define their extent in and out of the uh, section. Um, and this initial drum cluster here is just a kind of a crude attempt to, to uh, just kind of get it in the right place. Now, when we go through the inversion process, you know, we, we're bringing these points a little bit closer together, uh, we uh, tend to see this object flatten out a bit. And um, flat objects are really not objects that realistically represent the configuration of the drums at the site, are they? I mean, drums are if the drums are flattened, then they're ruptured. So, <clears throat> this, if we go through the inversion, we, we see this happen, and, you know, and I'm not taking time to go back into the program to do this, but if we do run the inversion and just allow these points to, to move around, the points on the drum cluster here, we've turned this off. In fact, the calculations get further away from the from the observations, and the dashed line indicates the original uh, position of the calculations associated with that object that we put in there. So, um, so we, we've actually increased the error in this case. So we're going to maybe move it up and you know try again and see if we can see if we can get it to work. So we move it up and uh, and uh, a little bit better perhaps, right? We get. But, but take a look at the geometry of this object. So you really have to plot things at scale, and when we plot this object at scale, we find that it, we can't really fit a drum in there, because here's feet. We assume that the drum, we'll, we'll just make things simple. We'll assume that we have um, a square drum, you know, a cross-sectional area of four feet squared, so two feet by two feet. Just Make life simple. Well, this is only a half foot here at its widest. We are going to be, we've, we've got magnetic material distributed closer to the surface. It produces an anomaly which uh, kind of fits. But we can't put any drums in there. If the drums are there, they've been steamrolled. They've been flattened. They, uh, they're no longer intact. But we know from our investigations at the uh, site that uh, uh, the, there's no detection of any contamination, so we believe that the drums are, are intact and we have to uh, excavate the area cautiously in order not to rupture them. So, so this model is a, a, obviously not a good one. We, we already know where the drums are, are they in this area, but are they up here, are they down here? We don't know yet. So again, 
put things to plot things up to scale. You can do this. Uh, uh, should be an end there. You can do this. Uh, uh, you know, as many times as you like, but keep scale in mind. Can you actually uh, fit a drum in there? So it turns out that the approach that we we have to take is to manually adjust the object to actually insert additional points. A triangle is probably not going to do it, but we can get in the ballpark certainly. And, and we may not really be able to do too much better than this. But as far as being able to figure out the number of drums, the possible number of drums, we're probably going to have to add additional points to the drum cluster object that we're using in our model. And we do need to keep in mind that as the drums get deeper and deeper in the profile, their influence on the anomaly is less and less because of that inverse cube rule. So um, next time we're just going to wrap up these, uh, you know, this this problem, and uh, again, kind of emphasize the limitations of the answer that we get. So thanks for thanks for joining us, and uh, talk to you next time.